our our study of the book of Judges, the study of the book of Judges. This is simply the book of Judges, part three, part three. Come on, put our hands together for the word of the Lord. All right, we, we're going to continue this study. I got you get your Bible, get your study notes, get what you, what you need to be able to kind of walk through this. Uh, these last um, two chapters, these last two chapters was really kind of, we were just kind of setting up. Uh, we were setting up the book of Judges uh, because I think it's really, really important for you to kind of understand the context of the book, for you to really be able to understand and receive the content of the book. There's something that God desires for us to be able to learn from the book of Judges. And as we've been walking through this, it's not really difficult for you and I to make present application when where we are in our lives and where we are in our society. And we got to continue uh, to make sure that we're modeling being the people of God and we're doing what we need to do in spite of the opposition, in spite of the persecution, in spite of the times in which we live. We need to make sure that we continue to be the people of God because it's the people of God in the book, in the time of Judges, because of the fact that they did not listen to or obey God's clear instructions, they literally forfeited God's best. And I, I think sometimes we miss this and I wanted to re reiterate this because a lot of times we, 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 we kind of want God's best. We desire God's best, but where salvation is free, but you have to notice that the blessings of God, they are they are conditional. There's no there's no condition of salvation. I just need to, by faith, the scripture said, by faith, I'm saved through grace. I'm saved through grace, but the blessings of the Lord, um, they are conditional. They're contingent upon my obedience. They're contingent upon me listening and obeying to the word of God, the voice of God, and what God tells me to do. And I can literally forfeit God's best in my life because I do not listen to his word. And we'll We'll come back to that in a moment. And another point I really want to emphasize from last week is just simply whenever I forfeit God's best, I am going to, it's inevitable, I'm going to have unnecessary pain and eventual bondage. It, it, it doesn't make it. Doesn't, I don't care how you slice it and dice it. I don't care what your name is. I don't care how anointed you are, how powerful and potent you are. If I if I forfeit God's best, I'm going to have unnecessary pain. I'm eventually have unnecessary pain, and I'm going to have bondage as well. I need to make sure that I posture myself in a way that where I do not set myself up for either one. So as we come to Joshua uh, Judges chapter three, we're going to see even the more how how important this, these principles. Are. Look at look at Judges chapter three verse number one. It's on the screen. It says, "Now these are the nations that the Lord left. These are the nations that the Lord left." And notice the purpose for inflection to do what to test Israel by them. These are the nations that God left. Now, when, when we're studying this and we're looking at this, uh, you, you know, you know, like I know, because we've been studying this, that, that God instructed the people of God to remove everybody. He told them to remove everybody, drive them all out of land. In fact, he says in Judges chapter 2, verse 21, in the previous chapter, look what God says. God says, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died. Verse 22, he says it again. He says what we just read in chapter 3, verse 1. In order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as, my fa as their fathers did or not. Verse 23 says, so the Lord left those nations not driving them out quickly. And he did not give to them, the, the, they did not give to them into the hand of Joshua. Here's verse 4. Listen to Judges 3, 4. It says, they were for the testing of Israel. To know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Again, what, what are you trying to say, bro, Pastor? I'm trying to say this. Thank God bless you. I appreciate your attendance. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to say this, that God commanded them to drive out the people, and they did not. And then God, one of the blessings that they forfeited, it was the hand of God, the provision of God, the protection of God, the way God says, I'm going to drive them out for you. And we just read what God says, I'm not going to drive them out for you so you had an opportunity to expel them and you didn't and 
God says, by my sovereign will, I could remove it, but I'm not. I'm going to leave them there for a purpose. Somebody say a purpose. I'm, I'm going to leave them there for a purpose. And so why is why will God leave the people in, of the nations in that land? It, it's a reason. I, and I, I told you because verse 1 says, because he wants to test Israel. And here, here's my first point. Come on, mark it down at home. Come on, put down that frying pan. Pick up your paper and, 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 and fill this in. Listen to this. God uses tests. Look at it. To expose what's in our hearts. Yes, he does. This is why God left the other nations there. Have you ever wondered, God, with this omniscient self, meaning all-knowing, God with his omnipotent self, meaning all-powerful, God with his omnipresent self, he's always at every place at every time, why is it that God does not stop certain things? Or why is it that God allows certain things? And in a real sense, in our text, in our context, why does God test me? Why, why does God test me? God tests you and I because he wants to explain expose what's in our heart. He doesn't want to expose what's in our heart so he can find out what's in our heart. He, he, wants to, he wants to test us and to expose what's in our heart so we can know what's in our heart. That's why God allows us to go through this. What, what does test mean? Test. Come on, this Bible study, y'all don't mind. The, the Hebrew word test simply means to put, listen, to put to test in order to ascertain or in order to gather, in order to get this information, the nature of something. Including, look at this, imperfections, faults, or other qualities. So, so God says, I'm going to allow these other nations, I'm going to allow these, these nations around you that are symbolic of struggle and pain and demons and warfare. If you want to make New Testament application, we're not fighting against nations and things of nature in our neck of the woods. We're praying for what's going on over there with Ukraine and what's going on with Russia. We're praying for them. But, but in our neck of the woods right now today, we're not fighting with other nations and things of that nature. But our battle as the book of Joshua is the people of God taking. Canaan and taking the promised land in the natural so it is the book of Ephesians is equivalent to the book of Joshua the way the people of God were taking land and taking territory in the spiritual and so as they fought in the natural you and I fought, you and I fight in the spiritual so God allows things to be around us to test us that's why we work around all them demons that's why we have all these issues in our family that's why we have all this stuff that's going on around us and all these things that God expose us to because God wants us to be able to see what, what where I'm at. He want to know where I'm at. And a lot of times, a lot of times my my, my profession does not match my possession. A lot, a lot of times I, I profess I'm somewhere. I profess that I got it all together. But God is saying, mm, I don't know all about that. And God allows us to be test. Just like we put metal to the fire, God allows you and I to be turned and be put in the fire of the furnace of affliction to be able to burn out all of those impurities just like fire refines precious metals God refines you and I through difficult circumstances so all I'm trying to tell you is my friend those difficult circumstances that you and I go through is not just for me to go through them but no it's something that God is trying to take me to and God is saying I want to take you somewhere but I got to burn all that stuff out of you and expose all that stuff in your heart because I can't take you to your next duty station with all that junk in your trunk with all that stuff in your heart and I and I will let you be tested to to expose you to prove you and this is what I'm trying to tell you that the purpose of tests is that God will, will want to know will we really obey him are we in are we in love with the blessing or are we in love with the blessed sword that's what that's what he wants to know and God tests his people to see if we're going to really obey him and see I think we have to we have to understand this and this is what's going on within the book of judges because God is literally giving the people people of God, not an open book test, but an open heart test. He's trying to see, I'm trying to, I'm trying to see what's in your heart, just like he did in the days of Abraham. He's testing our heart. And I think this is a real good place. That's why I like walking through the word of God, because like, like the prophet Gump said, you don't ever know what you're going to get. And I believe Holy Spirit dropped, dropped it on me to be able to kind of make a, di to kind of differentiate the difference between what trials and temptations, because, because trials slash tests, one and the same, that they, they come from God. But temptations don't come from God. They come from the enemy or they come from the enemy enemy. Come on. They, they, they come from something different. I want us to know the, know the difference. And tempta temptations, listen to me closely. Temptations come from our desires on the inside of us. 
While trials come from the Lord or tests come from the Lord. You don't believe me? Look at James chapter 1, verse 13. It said, let no one say when he is tempted. I am tempted. I am being tempted by God. Look what it says. For God cannot be tempted with evil. And he goes on to say, and he himself tempts no one. So God is not tempting you and I to sin. God is not tempting you and I with adultery. God is not tempting you and I where well, you fill in the blank, whatever that, is, that, that thing is. Verse number 14 says, here, here James illuminates it for. Where does the temptation come from then? But each person, how many is in each person? Everybody, but everybody is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Yes. So when you and I are tempted, we're only being tempted in an area that I've already been exposed to. It's already something on the inside of me that speaks to the temptation. Otherwise, it would not be a temptation. It, it, it's something on the inside. Something either I've been something I've been I've been imagining. You know, we can be we can be right here in 1989, Dunham, but we'll be way over there in, in Afghanistan somewhere. We can be in Hawaii somewhere. We can be your mind, your body can be here with me, but your mind on the other side of town. We 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 can we can be here present, but yet and still because of the things. And Jesus said if anybody think oh Jesus took it to a whole nother level he said if you think about uh, think about look on the woman that way you've already committed if you think if you got hatred in your heart towards somebody you've already killed them so in other words there's something that's on the inside of me I'm just trying to help you to understand where temptations come because we so slick when we were the people of God we become real slick and because of the fact because because we because we've gotten ourselves entangled in something we like to blame it on the Lord and say Lord you knew I wasn't strong enough to be able to meet him. So why you let him let why you let me meet him? You you know I would you knew if you if you didn't want me to be in this, you would have never let me meet him. You would have never went let me see that. I, why do you why you let me give them my number? Why you let me work there? Why you let me put that app like, oh y'all don't be blame. You don't know the saints to be blaming it. Blame it on the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Y'all blame everything on the Lord. Yeah, yeah, you do. And here can I tell you what the God <laughs> see 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 the devil tempts you and I. To destroy us. Listen to me closely. The devil tempts us to destroy us, but God tests us to develop us. I'm trying to help you here. The, de the devil tempts us to destroy us, but God tests us to develop us. The devil's end goal is never to appease me. It's never to satisfy me. It's never to get me to a place where I'm good. He only, he only just gives me a little bit to keep me coming back again. And God designs our tests. Our tests are tailor-made. Our tests, even though all of us go through tests, but my test isn't your test. And what you go through is not what I go through through but they're tailor made because God understand what's in our heart I love this because temptations are real logical mm, I deserve this we can deduce what we can do and how we can do it and how we can get away with it come on Annalise Keenan you can get, get away with murder <laughs> while trials are very unreasonable I don't understand why I'm going through this it's just not fair why, why, why me I, I paid my tithe I love the Lord and all that. But the temptation, oh, this makes sense right here. It's just what I like. Boy, y'all ain't talking to me right here. Let me let me go. God, God whenever, whenever it is that we are tested or when we're tempted, we need to know, we need to know the difference. Our test does not enlighten God, but rather it teaches us. I mean, see, some of us think we're so grown and we so saved, we can we can just expose ourselves to anything. And I believe this is much as what happened with the people of God, the way they felt like they would be good. But we're going to see what happens to them. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 16. It says, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know? He says that he might. It's the reason that he may humble you and test you that, to do you good in the end. And God humbles you and I, and God tests you and I, ultimately to do us good in the end. But the problem comes in is oftentimes we don't want to wait to the end. Oftentimes we want it right now. Oftentimes we manufacture and try to get ourselves to a place because I'm tired of going through and I, what I deserve. And we deduce ourselves to go faster than what God desires for me to go. But I need to know the difference. God said, I left the nations there. I left them there because I wanted to test you. Look, I love what this brother W. Graham says. Look what he says when it comes down to temptations. He said, when the devil tempts, it is that the tempted may fall. But when God tests, 
it is that the tested may stand. Oh, that's good to me. That's good. It, 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 when I'm tempted, the devil tempts you and I so we can fall. But then God allows you and I to be tested so we can be able to stand. And why does he want me to stand? Because he wants me to have the testimony that I went through what I went through. But I'm still standing. He wants me to stand because he wants me to see the fact that I may have had to go through this certain situation. And because I was able to weather the storm, now I'm able to encourage you. Now I'm able to help you. Now I'm able to tell you and I'm not trying to look at you in an arrogant way or tell you what you should have did or that couldn't have been me no I look at you and say God has no respect to a person and if I was able to stand in the middle of what I stood the same power the same anointing the same spirit on the inside of me he'll help you stand in the middle of your test that's all I'm trying to say when the enemy comes to tempt us we got to know that the enemy the enemy comes to tempt and there's no temptation that's taking us but such is common to man but God has given us a way of escape God said I I left them there to see what was in your heart. Yes, he did. I left them there to see what was in your heart. But that's that's just one thing. Let's go, let's go further because not only that, God will, look at this, God will, in his mercy, he will, come on, mark it down, write it down, God will repurpose my failures. Yes, he will. God will, in his mercy, in his mercy, he will repurpose my failure. Yeah, yeah, he will. He repurposed my faith. I told you, look at it in Judges chapter 3, verse number 1. This Bible said it, right? Come on, Judges 3, 1. He said, he left them there, Judges 3, 1, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. Look at this. So, 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 so now we got a new generation. We got a new crew. We got a new crew who is now coming into the promised land. And now they're actually, they're in the promised land. But now their forefathers who fought, the forefathers at war, the forefathers that been through what they've been through, they're gone. They're all dead. They're all gone. But now this is a new, this is a new, this is a new generation. And look what he says. He says, so they haven't experienced war. They don't know nothing about war. They, when they showed up, stuff was good. But look at verse 2. It says, it was only, come on, look at it. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war to teach war to those who had not known it before. In other words, God says, I not only this is a dual purpose. This is a this is a dual thing. God says, I'm literally repurposing your failure. I told you to drive them out. And since you didn't drive them out, I'm not going to drive them out. It was an epic fail. But I'm going to take your fail and I'm going to repurpose your fail. And I'm going to now teach you not how to dug it but I'm going to teach you how to live this thing. I'm going to teach you how to fight. What, what you're trying to say, bro, Pastor? I'm trying to tell you that God will repurpose my pain. I'm not telling you that God will take your sin and take your mess and take your line and take all that stuff and turn it around and work it together for your good. It doesn't start working together for your good till you start repenting. Oh, you can't be on your way to the crack house saying he's working it together for my good. You can't be on your way living La Vida Loca. Oh, and oh, y'all ain't going to help me here. And then all of a sudden, oh, he, he's working together. Whatever I'm going through, working together for my good. No, when you repent. I told you last week that when a repentance is a change of mind, change of heart, change of direction. And when you change your direction, God say, now I can step in. And now I can repurpose your failure. Now I'll work it together for, for your good. Lord, have mercy. It's a fire. Can I take the God? God? God said they're going to repurpose you know, repurpose some things. Oh, this is so good. I don't know. Is there anybody here? Is there anybody here? Well, God has, has repurposed your pain. It was not his, it was not his divine will and purpose for me to do what I did. But since I did it and owned up to it and fessed up, he said, since you did that, I'll take that and I'll get myself some glory. And it'll be for your good. It'll be for your betterment. God will repurpose your pain. Let me, let me hasten here because look what God says in Judges chapter 2, verse 14. He said, the Bible said, the anger of the Lord was kindled. It was kindled against Israel. And he gave them over to the plunderers. What do you what do you do when, when, when God gives you over? God gives you over to the plunderers. When God, when God, when God gives them over to the, the plunder, he said, he, look at this. The Bible says, and and he and, and he, he being God, he sold them into the hand of those that were sojourning, the sojourning enemies, so that they that they that they could no longer withstand their enemies. God, God, God fixed this so he says, <laughs> He says, I'm no longer gonna help you. And I'm, never, and I'm no longer going to give you the strength that you need to endure the fight. 
I'm not going to I'm not going to help you anymore. God is saying, I'm disciplining you. I'm, I'm training you. I'm trying to build you up because here I'm giving you over to them. In other words, God is allowing them. And you'll see later the way God is literally strengthening the hand of their enemy because of their disobedience. But come on, let's pick it up. Judges 3, 3. We're doing good. Judges 3, 3. Look at it says. These are the nations. These are the nations. It's the Bible says uh, the, 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 the five laws of the Philistines. And all of the Canaanites and the Sidonianites and the Havites who lived on the Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal, Her Hermon, look at it, as far as Lebo Hamath. Come on. <laughs> and so, so, so these, these five nations, these five lords that, 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 that are still there, the, the sad thing is, and we'll see this again, the sad thing is, bump it up a little bit, the sad thing is, is that these nations that, that are there, not the mic, the, 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 the temperature, look, the, the, here can I tell you, the sad, the sad thing is, the sad thing is that they had previously conquered them. Three of the five they had previously conquered, and now God is allowing them to be conquered. They had, they had already gotten the victory. We're going to come back to that in a moment. I don't want to show my hand. Look at Judges chapter 3, verse 5. It says, so the people of Israel lived among. They did what? Lived among. I, I want you to see this. The people of God, the people of Israel, they, they come on here. You're from the north side. They stayed. They stayed, they stayed over there among the Canaanites. That's the RJV version, the Ruth James version. Say they stayed. So the peoples of Israel stayed among the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Havites, the Jebusites. They stayed there. So they, so they stayed there. But look what happens. Verse 6 says, and their daughters they took to themselves for wives. So the, so the people of God, they stand there and they're looking at their daughters and say, hmm, she looked like, she looked like a, a good Israelite to me. She, she like a Jew. She like a Jew to me. And so she, they took, they took the daughters. Look where it started. The guy started, and their own daughters they gave to their sons. It was an even swap, no swindle. And then here it is. Then they served their gods. I want you to see this because you, you and I don't overnight begin to all outright disobey God. We don't, we don't do it overnight. You don't, take, you don't take someone who's strong in the faith or someone who's mature in the faith and then now all of a sudden they just go cold turkey. No, no, no. It's a process. No, it, it happens in stages. In verse 5, they stayed with the enemy. In verse 6, they begin to intermarry the enemy. And now the end of verse 6, they went, they went from staying there to marrying them to worshiping their God and can I tell you that we can watch and look at our own progress and our own lives and can see when we're heading in the wrong direction I can always tell when somebody got one foot out the door and one foot on a banana peel because they, they, they stopped you'll see first they first they stop attending then they don't come as much and they don't serve as much and they, they don't participate as much and they always look like they've been drinking or, or sucking on lemons all night and here you get it just kind of it's just a, a back it's going back 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 y'all know Chris Berman Chris Berman Back, 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 and hear that we, and that's how we can look at our lives and hear when we're not as faithful or when we're not as loving or we stop giving. That, that's what they say. The church, the church, uh, the church, 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 the people that do the, the statistics and all of that, the experts say that the, the first thing that leaves whenever a person is a transition from ministry is their money. They'll, they'll, they'll stay with you for another year, but, but stop giving a whole year earlier. Y'all gonna help me here. I ain't, I ain't getting nothing. I don't care if it's, I don't care if it's 83 strong. I ain't, I ain't giving, I ain't giving Nathan Jones. Here, can I tell you? Here, you, we, you and I can look at our lives and model our lives and see how the people of God have gotten to the place where they're falling away. And God literally is allowing us to study this because He's showing us what not to do. This is the pattern of backslide. And remember from last week, can I, can I borrow something from last week, y'all man? Come on, I gave it to you. It's the top of your paper right now. On the top right. Help myself. God bless you, Sister Ruth. Can I tell you, falling away is inevitable when I begin what? Imitating the world. Look at this pattern. They moved in. They lived next to them. And now they're imitating the world. And then we discuss. It's already there for you. It says falling away is inevitable when I become what? Friends with the world. Come on. See, look at, look at the downward spiral. Look at the next one. Falling away is inevitable when, when, when I become what? Spotted by the world. Look, let me keep going. Because falling away is inevitable when I do what? Fall in love with the world. Lastly, falling away is inevitable when I become what? Conformed to the world. Look at, look at how the people of God, because I would like to believe that they thought they was tough enough to handle living in the midst of all that sin. And when the, the moment that you and I... <laughs> The moment you and I get to the place where we let our guards down 
and we're not sober and we begin imitating the world. It, the Bible says, Song of Solomon 2.15, it's the small foxes that spoil the vine. First, First Corinthians 5 and 6 says, it's a little leaven that leaven the whole lump. It's those small things. That's a little, but the proverb writes, a little fold in other hands. That's a little bit of, oh, I don't know, well, I'm good. Oh, God don't mind. He's just going to have to forgive me for that. When we begin imitating the world, becoming friends with the world, becoming spotted with the world, we fall in love with the world, then we become, we become conformed to the world. And you see the people of God's downward spiral, and I believe it's all because of their company. Look what this man of God said. He'll be here Sunday. He'll be wrapping up this whole forgiveness series. Look what he said. He said, idolatry is often the result of who is influencing me. See, we can create our own God. But it's a whole lot easier to kind of, ooh, I like that God over there. And, and we're, not, we're not talking about, see, we, we so many people kind of check out, clock out when we talk about idolatry. Like we're talking about a molten calf or a King Nebuchadnezzar. And his, his, no, 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 no. Idolatry is any, come on, remember Tony Evans said that idolatry is any unauthorized now. That's a person, place, or thing oh, that I look to to meet my needs. Anything that I look to to appease me or satisfy me or help me or soothe me. And other than God, it has become, it's become an idol. And idolatry it oftentimes is a result of who's influencing me. And we see this so often in our relationships because we enter into most relationships with the right intention. Thinking that we can help them, change them, embedder them. And oftentimes they end up pulling us in the wrong direction. We, we enter into relationships saying, oh I, oh, oh, I can change him. Oh, I, he, he'll get saved. I just keep on hanging around. He'll get saved. I keep going to church. Amen. And then soon you're trying to go. He's like, oh, you're going, you going tonight, baby? Please don't go tonight. Please stay here with me. I was, ho I was hoping, baby, you was going to cook that. I, ho I was hoping you was going to slip into something a little more comfortable. Y'all gonna talk to me here. And, and here, and here, that's a, don't you listen, don't you listen. And here, and here, that's, that, that's how it starts. And then it goes from, it goes from an offer. It goes from an offer to now demanding. And now it goes to this and that. And you pick this over me and all this kind of stuff. No, my friend. And I'm not talking about coming to a building or coming to a work. I'm talking about in our heart. I'm talking about I can't be at a certain place in my walk with God. And just because I'm in relationship with somebody, I'm gonna start downsizing who I am to God and my service to God and my faithfulness to God oh no my friend I cannot allow you either either you're going to help me or, you, or you're hurting me oh let me let Paul talk to you because ain't Pastor Kobe bothering you look at 1 Corinthians 15 33 Paul say don't fool yourself that's the Kobe James verse don't, don't, don't fool yourself bad company ruins good morals you, you would think this is how we, this is how we, this is how we think no. you, you would think that it's much easier for my holiness to be contagious you would think that my, my righteousness, my passion, my zeal for the things of God, my, my, my drive that I have for things of God, you would think that would be contagious. But no, it, it doesn't work that way. Disease spreads. Health doesn't. That, that, that's why y'all sitting here with, with masks on right now. Can, can, I, can I tell you? Because you don't want that COVID. You don't want that COVID. That, co co that Rona. That Rona is, that Rona, 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 Rona is, is, is lurking. And here you. And here. It, 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 when it amazes, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm fully healthy. And you feeling some type of way. You would think I can just come and rub you. And my health will jump on your health. Oh, it doesn't work that way. But why is it you can, you can, you can, you can cough on me, sneeze on me, and we'll, and our disease will spread quicker. That's so it is in the natural. Preach, boy. So it is in the spiritual. And you wonder why all of a sudden, you wonder why all of a sudden you got to a place in your walk with God. The things got things you never wouldn't think of doing, imagine doing, but because of your company that you kept, they began to corrupt your good manner. And people will start, they'll start chipping away at your faith and chipping away at your drive and, put, and chipping away at what you know as your values and your morals. And they'll begin to chip away. But no, my friend, you got to make sure that you're all Always stay, you always stay sober. I wish I was helping the people of God on how on how to live here. Because this this is no easy this is no easy task. It's no easy task. Uh, look 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 what look what Solomon said in, in Proverbs chapter four verse twenty three. Look what Solomon, this Bible said it right. Y'all don't mind. Look at look at look Proverbs four twenty three. Look look what Solomon says. Solomon says, "Keep your heart with all vigilance." In other words, be alert. In other words, guard your heart. 
In other words, guard your heart and don't let things come into your heart. Don't put things into your heart. Don't, don't. Be careful what you watch. Be, be careful what you say. Be careful what you do. You got to guard your heart. He said from it flows the springs of life, the issues of life. Jesus said it's not what, go, he said, it's not what, what goes in. He said not what comes out of a man that defiles, but what goes in a man. And we got to be able to guard our heart. Listen, this is so powerful. Because the brother that wrote this couldn't do it himself. The, the verse we just read, keep your heart with all, all, vigil, all vigilant. Guard your heart. Don't let people, places, things, stuff, don't let people, don't let people in your heart because they'll turn your heart. Solomon wrote this. Just because he wrote it and he couldn't keep it, I don't mean it takes away this potency and importance, but it just shows us that this is just easier said than done. And Solomon, who was, the Bible says, God. The Bible, come on, help me. Who says who's the wisest man that ever lived other than Jesus? You mean to tell me the wisest man? I don't, I come on, I, 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 I'm not, I'm nowhere on the stratosphere with Solomon when it comes down to wisdom. And you mean to tell me the wisest man that ever lived can give me this advice and he couldn't keep it? And here I am, oh, I can be her friend, and we can, be, we can keep it, we can keep it all, what that word is, we can keep it, uh, we can keep it, it's all with a P, what is it? Platon we keep it we keep it platonic and then it turns into me being Mr. Bubonic. Come on here, Miss Bombastic. Totally fantastic. Come on here. It go, it goes from platonic to bombastic. Come on here. It goes from it goes from platonic to not genuine that pony. That, 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 that. Anyway, here can I can I tell you? It can, I can, we keep a platonic relationship. But but solid, solid say, keep guard your heart. Okay, y'all don't, don't believe me. Y'all don't believe me. Y'all think I'm meddling. Y'all think I'm meddling. Look, look, look at 1 Kings 11 4. Look at this. Look at, look at the Bible. Come on, just some folk on, on Twitter. Come on, all y'all heathens. Come on. First, we don't stream on Twitter no more. That's why I be bothering people on Twitter. I'm not calling nobody no heathens. Look at 1 Kings 11 and 4. It's going to be all the heathens next Thursday night. Look at this. 1 Kings 11 and 4. It says, for, for, for when Solomon was old, <laughs> his wives turned. Away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God. Look at this. As was the heart of David his father. That's a powerful point to me. That Solomon tell me to guard my heart. And he's the wisest man that ever lived. And he couldn't guard his own. So this shows me that this, 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 this should make me sit up on the edge of my seat and say, I need to make sure I guard my heart because these people that I love and these things that I do that are so innocent and these things that I'm doing with the right motive and the right intention, if I'm not careful in guarding my heart, they'll turn me away from God's purposes and turn me away from God's will. And the enemy can have you taking the church bus to hell. It's a Thursday night. Oh, oh. And let me say, hey, look, 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 look. <laughs> let me tell you what this man of God said. It's good. He said, he says, your closest relationships will either, look at this, tune your heart to the voice of God or turn your heart from God. Your, your closest relationship, your closest relationship, they're either going to tune your heart Tune your heart to the voice of God. See, I need, I need accountability people around me. I, I don't need people around me that makes it easy for me to sin. I don't need people around me that makes it easy to say, oh, don't worry about it. It's cool. I don't need to be hanging around people that's just trying to be slick and, and trying to do that. No, no, no. I need, I need accountability. And whenever it is that you have accountability, people say, no, that's not what God said. No, did you pray about it? No, don't leave. No, don't quit. No, don't do that. Don't act like that. Don't respond that way. Oh, but I don't need people around me to turn my heart. Let me ask you a quick question. I had noon day this, and they felt me when I asked them this. When was the last time somebody commended you for being the bigger person? We, we don't commend each other on that. But when we go off on somebody, oh, you got him, didn't you? You told him, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, you told him from the rooter to the tutor. Yeah. Couldn't have been me. Top to the bottom. You read them. Yeah. When was the last time somebody said, oh, you did that? You did. You was a bigger, you was a bigger person. Now, that is, that is so commendable on how you humbled yourself that way. I saw how they talked to you, and you humbled yourself. No, nah, not all old trifling friends. Oh, you let them do you like that? Why you let him do you like that? Why you let him talk to you like that? Oh, he ain't come home again. What time it is that he ain't there? 
Call that joke. Ain't no way in the world. He was talking to me. Ain't no way in the world. Little boo boo. Ain't no way in the world. Oh, y'all know, y'all know, y'all know. Y'all know what, I'm what the point? What the point I'm trying to make is that, oh, fuddy duddy, y'all. I'm trying to tell you that here. I need people around me. Oh, that don't make, don't appease me in my mess and don't stroke me in my mess and don't pacify me in my mess. But no, they say you need to do the right thing. You need to get your heart and your mind towards the things of God. No, I know you hurt right now. I know you frustrated right now. I know your feelings hurt right now. They they did overwork you. They did underappreciate you. Oh, they did overlook you. Oh, but you still need to honor God in every situation. Solomon said, God, your heart. And Solomon in God is hard. So you and I got to be able to get to the place where we're sober in God in our hearts by watching the people that are around us. And here we often find this. I got to move. We often find this in our, in our romantic relationships. I'm, I'm going to tell you plainly, y'all. Don't, don't, don't get hooked up with nobody. Don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you, are, you are making one of the biggest mistakes of your life. I can, I can say that boldly, and I can say that every single time, every single time, so <laughs> every single time somebody's hooked up all with a, with a project, oh, I'm going to get them right with God. If you want to go on a missionary journey, come on, join us every fourth Saturday at Callaway Cove. If you if you want to if you want a project, come on. If you if you if you try if you want to win somebody, come on. We got plenty of cards. We can go out here and pass out cards and flyers. Don't don't say I do with somebody. Talking about you gonna change them. The, the will of God, God could God's powerful. He can change them. He can let your light shine and you can win them with no words and all that. But I, I'm still trying to find that testimony. I don't know a whole lot like that. They're out there somewhere because the scripture says it can happen now. But I'm just telling you from my pastoral perch. Most times I see divorce or I see, I see divorce. I see depression. I see defeat. I see individuals. Me, just a, I'm miserable. How did I get like? That's all I see. All right. I like that right there. Let me go. Judges chapter 3, verse number 7. Let me keep, keep going here. Let me bring can I bring my lights to all of the light? Let me go to Judges chapter 3, verse 7 says, and, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And they forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. They, they, they served. So the people, they didn't, they didn't learn their lesson. They didn't, they didn't do right. They wouldn't, they wouldn't let God be great. They just had to just go on and do what they needed to do. And they began to serve these other gods. So, so what? Would, what would it be? I, I know you may ask a question. I know I did looking at this, studying this. <clears throat> Why? What, what's so attractive about their idolatry? You, you ever notice whenever man makes a religion, it's never a religion that costs us something. It's always something that speaks to us. It's always something that emboldens us. It's always something that speaks in confidence. It's, it's never, no, no religion ever say, well, in order for you to cross these burning sands, you got to cut your right arm off. How many know that the only person will be there is, is, is you know, the, the person that's telling you you need to do that? Come on, that's not, that's not appealing enough. But when you look at the Canaanite religion, this religion that they're being tempted with, I have a picture of Baal last week, couldn't get to it. Um, many theologians, they say you pronounce his name Baal, B-A-A-L, Baal, but I say Baal, so I'm going to bail out on Baal and say Baal. Can I tell you here, here, here Baal or Baal, this was, this was, a, this was a, this is a picture of, of, of seemingly, of, of their figment of their imagination, their Canaanite God that they made up. Here, his name just simply means master or Lord. Listen to me. It's a generic term for God. Y'all got to follow me on this because this is what the people of God are being so tempted with. They're being tempted with, with, this, with this worship. Baal, who is the god of fertility, uh, the god of the agriculture, rather, with, with all of the animals and all the livestock and all these types of things. And an Ashtoreth, which you just saw the name mentioned there. Ashtoreth is a god of, of, of love and the god of sex and the god of, of, of abundance. And so here, according to their pagan worship, they would say whenever, whenever uh, El, who is the, the head god, which means creator god, El and Ashtoreth hooked up first, and then when they got together, they they, they cause all of the crops and all the animals and all the things. And then, then Baal, I mean, El, El follow me, El and Ashra got together. They had Baal, 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 Baal. They had the little baby God. And when they had the little baby God here, now him and his mama got together. 
And then this is this is this how, this how it keeps going. And, and, and I'm like, hmm. and like you got the, hmm. you got the, uh, hmm. now the RACA doll. Hmm. So that that's, so so the mama mom, mama mama Astra and and, and Bell get together, hook up, and so that they, they, they hooking up is what causes the abundance of the crop, the abundance of the animals, uh, it's prosperity. And and so so that their worship say whenever they getting it on. That, that's, that's, that means fertility. And so they would go into their pagan temples. They would go and, and start this how they would go. They have priests and priests in the temple. And so they would act out. I'll just leave it that way. They would act out what they were doing. And while they were doing that, here it is, while they were doing that, they're praying, saying, Lord, increase our crops, increase our abundance. So this was tied to prosperity. And not only prosperity, it was tied to their sensual nature. Now, how many know if that's the way we worship? I don't got to pass out no gift cards. If that's a, if that's what we, if, if we I don't got to give I got I don't got to give nobody no gift. If that if that's the way we worshiping, if we say oh we don't I ain't never did that I ain't never did that at that church. You mean tell me that's how we doing praise and worship around here? This this was this was so this was what was so alluring. I'm just trying to paint the picture, of you all. This is what was so alluring to the people because not only did it appease them and speak to them as relates to where they were, it spoke to them as relates to prosperity. But verse eight here, let me say this: uh, Judges chapter three, verse eight says, "Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against against Israel, and he did what? He sold them into the hand of, <coughs> excuse me, king of Mesopotamia. What's wrong? Excuse me." <coughs> And, and, and the people of Israel served, <coughs> excuse me, uh, eight years. What's wrong? What's wrong? I said, y'all know, y'all ain't gonna say bless me, gazuntite, gazuntite, no nothing, no nothing. Kushan, reshatabata, reshatabata. So he need to die. This is what his dad's name is. That's all. I mean, he need, he need off with his head. Come on here. So here, look. look. So they 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 served this brother whose name means double wickedness. So this boy, this brother was really, really wicked. But what's what's the point? There's never say say that with me. There is never say that. There's never, there's never a wasteful words, a wasteful words in, the in the Bible. If the Bible tells us something, it's something that's there for us to dig into. And so the Bible says this brother was from Mesopotamia. You see that in verse eight. You mess with Mesopotamia is something that's very that's very strategic. Now they're in bondage to these individuals for eight years. That means eight years they're in they're, they're in bondage. That means they're not free. They're in poverty. They're hungry. They're, they're, their crops were stolen. Their spouses were taken and abused for eight years. This brother comes a long way from Mesopotamia. But look at Acts chapter seven verse two. It tells us the significance of Mesopotamia. Acts seven two says, and Stephen said, look at this. Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in <coughs> Mesopotamia. Uh, okay, what you trying to say, brother Pastor? A Abraham is the progenitor. He is, he's the, he's the father of the faith. He's the one that all of these children of Israel come from. In other words, God called him out of Mesopotamia, called him out of idolatry, called him out of pagan worship. And God said, I'm going to bless you. And in blessing you, I'm going to make your father a many nations. So God called them out and now the same. Look, let me just say what I'm trying to say. My consistency, look at the, put my point up. Come on, look at it. My consistency can cause me to be captured by the very thing he called me out. Try again. I'm trying again. I'm trying again. I, I did better than I did noonday. So I don't know. This is on y'all. This ain't on me this time. Look, look at this. So let me try one more time. When I'm inconsistent with my walk with God, that can cause me to be captured by the very thing he called me out of. All right. What, what am I saying? A A Abraham, <laughs> Abraham, thank you, thank you very much. A Abraham came out of Mesopotamia, but because of their inconsi in inconsistency, now God is allowing them to be captured and to be conquered over the very thing that he set them from, set them free from, and liberated them out of. The point I'm trying to make to you all is that God can denounce some things in our life, and God can eradicate some things in our life, and God can kill some kings in our life, but I can be so inconsistent and be so fixated on doing what I desire to do, I can re-elect that same king that God removed. Let me go, let me go. I thought that was good, so I parked there for a minute. Judges 3.9 says, but, but when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, in God good? As soon as they cried out, the Bible says, the Lord raised up a deliverer. But I got a question before we, before we give them too much kudos there. Judges 3.9. Why did it take them so long? Eight years. They cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up a deliverer. What, what does deliver? What is another name for deliverer is a 
is a judge. That's right, is a, is a judge. They raised up a judge over the people of Israel who saved them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. So this is Caleb's younger brother is the judge that God raises up. So here, this is our first, this is our first judge. First judge name is Othniel. Othniel. Somebody say Othniel. 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 It'll be worth a gift card one day. It's the name of the first judge. Othniel. Othniel. We already met this brother. <clears throat> we met this brother back in. This Bible said it, right, y'all? Y'all don't mind? We just walked in the Bible. Just, that's why I'm so sorry, y'all. We'll, uh, I'll figure something out <clears throat> another time. The next Thursday, I'll preach something else. Next Thursday night. Look at that. First, first judge, look at Judges chapter, chapter 1, verse, verse 12 says, And Caleb said, He who attacks <coughs> and captures it, I will give him Ashkeshah, my daughter for, for wife. Anybody see that? That's what it says, right? It says, I'm going to give you Ashley, my, my, daughter, my daughter for wife, is, 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 what, is, what he, is what he says here. So listen to this. Caleb, listen, I don't want y'all to miss this, because Caleb says, I need somebody to attack this city. Whoever attacks this city and captures this city, I'm going to give them my daughter. You see that? Verse 13 says, here's where we met Othniel, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it. Look at it. And he gave it to Ashley. His, and he gave, he gave him Ashley, his daughter, for wife. Well, hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. So, so Caleb, and Caleb is Othniel's uncle. And then he gives his nephew his daughter. So this is son few. Son, nephew, son few. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, come on, don't you? The Bible said it. Why you? It's a son few. Son in son few. All right, I will. I will. I tried to dance. Second, second Thursday, I tried to. It's a son few, y'all. That's funny to me. That's a son few. This is, this is Caleb's little brother, which is his nephew. He marries. Anyway, let's say, Othniel, in spite of that indiscretion, he is a, he is a, he's a, he's a bad boy. Look what his name means. That's going to hit you next Tuesday. Watch over like, oh, that's what he meant by son few. His son and nephew. That's what, that's what he meant. Anyway, don't worry about it. Uh, powerful. Y'all still, still trying to process it, trying to get it. His name means powerful one. He's a lion. Most powerful. Look, here it is. This brother say, this is what his name is. Here it is. Verse 10. Don't miss it. Look at, look at Judges 3.10. It's good, y'all. Look at it. The spirit of the Lord was upon him. And he judged Israel, and he went out to war, and the Lord gave him <coughs> king of Mesopotamia into his hand. And his hand prevailed over, <coughs> God, y'all, what are these allergies? God, God, God. Yeah, it's good. yeah, I'm good, no, I'm good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I think the Lord just put that in there because he knew I was going to be reading this this night. He said, put that in there like five more times so he can, so he can climb himself here. Look, Kushan Rasharaha. Look, it said, so here, look. <laughs> here's the point. Here's the point. You felt that, huh? <laughs> look, here's the point. Let, this, 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 verse 10, the spirit of the Lord was upon him. This is the point. The spirit of the Lord came upon him. And see, Old Testamently speaking, Old Testamently speaking, the Holy Spirit came upon them to complete certain tasks. You and I have Holy Spirit on the inside of us, but also it is equivalent to the anointing of God. What, what's my point? Look at it. God equips his people for whatever our assignment is. God, God equipped. The Spirit of the Lord came upon them. And the Lord equips his people for whatever, I, I say for whatever our assignment is. God, God equips his people. In other words, God gives you what it is that you need to do what you need to do. You, he got God, God not only calls you, but God equips you. God empowers you. God puts his super on your natural. He gives you the anointing to do what you need to do. Judges 3.11 says, so the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenez, died. So they had rest for 40 years. 40 is a number of generations. And so because of his obedience, because of his faith in God, he, he gave a whole generation rest and prosperity. That's, that's some good stuff right there. Come on. Judges chapter 3, verse 12. Yeah, clap. Right, somebody was trying to. I don't know where it went. It just kind of. Yeah. <laughs> Judges 3, 12. It said, but the people of Israel, oh, no, again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon. I got that one now. Eglon. The king of Moab against Israel. 
because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Look at look at Eglon. Eglon, Eglon ain't no better. Look at Eglon. Look what his name means. So, so here come another, here go another nation taking over the people of God. After 40 years of rest, now Eglon. Eglon named me a fine bull calf. Large and fat. That's what Eglon names me. In, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a real sense, his name just simply means a strong heifer. I'm just telling you what. Just tell me what the Bible says. Am I making anything up? It's, right. it's literally there. Eglon. So don't y'all start calling folk Eglons around here. Say, oh, yo, Eglon. What you, what you learn in the Bible study? Oh, I learned about a strong heifer. That's what the man named me. Eglon. A heifer is just a female cow. That's all that means. I don't know what y'all... You strong heifer, for you. Look at Judges. I couldn't even say. Judges three thirteen says he gathered himself. Look at this. Don't miss this, y'all. With my foolishness. Don't miss me with my foolishness. Look at this. He gathered to himself the Ammonites, the Amalekites, and he went and he defeated Israel. So Eglon, with his Eglon, Eglon went and got a confederate. He went and got all these other nations to be able to defeat Israel because of their disobedience and took possession of the city of Palms. Uh, the, the city of Palms is just simply Jericho. That's all Deuteronomy talks about is the city of Jericho. Don't worry about that because here all I want to just show you was the fact that God gave them something but whenever it is I choose to walk in my own way, I, will have, I have to give something up. God gave them Jericho but because of their disobedience they had to give it back up again. Judges chapter 3 verse 14 says and the people of Israel served Eglon the king of Moab. How long? 18 years. They was in bondage for 18 years, following, following after Eglon, following after other gods, and now they don't have no joy. They have no peace. They have no purpose. Here, look at verse 15. Come on, we're going to get it. Verse 15 says, And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised them up a deliverer. What's a deliverer? That's a, a, a judge. Ehud. 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 There it is. I'm coming. Ehud. Ehud is, is, is raised him up, son of Gura, uh, the, the Benjamite, a, a, a son, a, a left-handed man. Look what it says. The, the, the people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, king of Moab. So follow the picture. We're going to be wrapping up in a minute. Come on, follow, follow the picture. What's going on here? So here, because of their disobedience, God raises up Eglon. Eglon has the people in oppression, has them in bondage. Now Ehud comes and he's giving the, he's giving the king some tribute, some money for him being the king and being the over them. And so the Bible, again, there's never wasteful words in the Bible. The Bible said this brother was a Benjamite, a left-handed man. And, and, so, and so this brother Ehud, he is the second judge. So we've already had the first judge. Who was the first judge? Othniel, that's right. And then the second one is Ehud. Look, look at this. Look, his name just seems he's strong. He's, he's strong and praising all that. But what's, what's, what's significant about this is what God says. God says he's from the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin, which literally, Benjamin literally means son of my right hand. Jacob had Benji when he was an old man. And, and so, and so this, is, this, is what, this is what happened. J J Jacob had Benja Benjamin when he was old because Joseph was, 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 a, was a knee boy, as the season saints say, the knee baby. J Joseph was a knee baby, and then here Benjamin was the baby boy. So Jacob had Benji when he was old. So, so here, look, look, what's the point I'm trying to make here? Is that he says he's a son of my right hand. But look, the Bible says he's a son of the right hand, but he's left-handed. Look, look at this. And so when you look at, the, when you look at this, this, this left-handedness that's pointed out in the Bible, this is not a handicap in other cases of the scripture. In, in this case, it kind of sends a signal that it is. But, but really and truly, as you continue to study here, we, we see that these individuals, they're, they're ambidextrous. They're able to use their right hand and their left hand equally well. You see this in First Chronicles 12 and 1, later on in the life of David. Now these are the men that came to David and Ziglag while they could no longer, could no longer move about freely because of Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men, look at this, who helped him in war. Look at verse 2. They were bowmen and could shoot arrows and sling stones with either, look at this, the right or the left hand. They were Benjamites, Saul's kinsmen. Judges Judge chapter 20, verse 16 said, among all these were 700 chosen men who were what? Left-handed. Everyone could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. 
These, these were some bad boys. They, 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 they were highly skilled. They were highly trained. They can use both hands. And any time you look in the scripture, hands is, are, are always indicative of our service and our purity and what we give to God. In other words, all I'm trying to tell you is you need to use both hands. All I'm trying to tell you is that you just need to be strong. I'm going to use prayer and praise. I'm going to use giving and serving. Come on, you got to be able to use both hands. Let me get out of here. I'm going to preach that one day. And look, Judges 3.16 says, and Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubic and left. We done, we done. And he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon, look what the Bible says, was a very fat man. That's what the Bible says. Verse 18. Now you know when the Bible says you advanced in years, I mean you're really old. And when the Bible says he was a very fat man, he had to be, he had to be, he had to be healthy. He had to be very healthy. Verse, verse 18 says, and when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, look at this. He sent away the people who carried the tribute. You see this? Verse 19, but he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence, and, and, he, and all his attendants went from out of his presence. Come on, y'all listen to me. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Here, Ehud is that he comes to the king. And he says to the king, I have a special message for you, king. And he, the king says, before you give me this special message, he put all of his people out. And he said, it's just me and you talking right now. Verse 20 says, Nehud came to him. And as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber, Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. Verse 21. Y'all looking at it? Verse 21. And Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. Verse 22 says, and the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade. For he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. I, I didn't think y'all was going to be able to really get that and, and, and see what it was I'm trying to say, so I gave you another translation so you can really, so we can really drive the point home. New, new, living, new, new Living says, the dagger went so deep that the handle disappeared beneath the king's fat. So Ehud did not pull out the dagger, and the king's bowels emptied. Yeah. This brother killed the king. I told you the book of Judges read it I'm sorry, y'all. Verse 23 says, and Ehud went out, out of the porch and closed the doors of the roof of the chamber behind him, and he locked it. Verse 24 is on the screen. It says, when he had gone, the servants came in. And, and the Bible says, and when they saw that the doors of the roof of the chamber were locked, they thought, surely, surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. You know what that means, right? They thought they thought the king was in the in the restroom. He's indisposed. The king, king, king using the restroom. Iggy, Iggy, he's using the bathroom right now. Verse verse 25 says, and they waited till they were embarrassed. Oh, surely I know he had them chili slaw dogs for dinner, but <laughs> surely the king has never been in there that long, is what they said. But 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 when he did, <laughs> but when he still did not open the doors, the roof of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened it, and there their Lord lie, there the, there the Lord lie on the floor. Verse twenty six said, Ehud escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols of the and escaped into Sharan. Verse twenty seven says, and when he arrived, oh the Bible says he sounded a trumpet in the hill of the country of Ephraim, and the, the then the people of Israel went down from with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. Verse twenty eight. And he said to them, follow me, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies and Moabites into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the falls of, of the Jordan against the Moabites and did not allow anyone to pass over. Verse 29, and they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men, not a man escaped. Verse 30 says, so Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. God gave them the victory as a result of, of Ehud being the second deliverer. God raised him up. Come on, put your hands together. Give him some praise right there. Give him some glory.